Hello everyone and welcome to our latest installment of Build Your Simulation Nastran in CAD IQ. Uh, my name is Marwan Azam and with me presenting today is Dean Rose. We're both technical support specialists uh, with the uh, simulation team here at Autodesk. Today's topic is buckling verification with Autodesk Nastran in CAD. Uh, so we're going to go through some examples, and Dean's going to talk to us about uh, setting up these uh, analyses. Uh, before we start, just a, few, a couple of slides here um, about the Autodesk Help Webinar series. Uh, the Build Your Simulation, uh, Build Your Nest and Incad IQ series is a live bi-weekly technical discussion hosted by Autodesk Nest and Incad support and sales team. Uh, these are usually 20 to 40 minute presentations, uh, topics chosen based on previous data extracted from webinar surveys. So we take your uh, input into consideration to decide what we want to talk about. Um, by the way, this will, I think, uh, shortly be changed into a once a month uh, broadcast and not bi-weekly. Uh, the most recent webinars in this series uh, is getting the data out of NASTRAN in CAD you need to design working with content constraints, contact constraints in Nastra and NCAD, how to know you have a good mesh in Nastra and NCAD. Uh, we haven't decided yet on the uh, upcoming topics. To sign up um, for these webinars, you go to the SimHub events page and you sign up, then you get an email telling, uh, reminding you of those. We also encourage you to go to uh, our uh, forum page on Autodesk, um, where do we post? All these webcasts or webinars can be found on the Autodesk Simulation 360 YouTube channel. So if you want to watch this again or any of the previous ones, that's where you'd want to go. What's in the news? Uh, for NAS Inca 2016, we have released a hotfix, hotfix one, so I encourage everyone to download that. That should be managed uh, automatically uh, for you, but just so you're aware, that is out. It has fixes targeting issues caused by non-US number systems, automatic surface contact generation with German operating system, performance issues for models with a large number of surfaces. So this is basically a hot fix. It doesn't have enhancements, but basically box fixes. Some older news here. Self-based training for NASA and NCAT is out. Help can now be downloaded to your local drive if you don't want to go through the internet every time you want to access the help. And we have update one for Inventor 2016. And if you're stuck, we encourage you to go to the customer service accounts management and log in a tech support case, and we'll be glad to help you with that. So, like I said, today's uh, topic is buckling analysis in NASRA and NCAD, and I'm going to turn over the presentation to Dean, and uh, he will show us a few things uh, that are interesting. Dean? Thanks, Marwan. All right, we got through all the administrative stuff. Now we can get to the meat of the presentation. Uh, like Marwan mentioned, we're going to be discussing some information about buckling today. We're going to start with covering what is buckling, um, and then how do we analyze that with the with our simulation software. So we're going to go over some uh, points on workflow. And along with the available solvers that we have, some of the limitations and some of the advantages. So uh, overall, we're going to give you a good impression of, of what to do and why we're going to do it. So it should be uh, very interesting for everyone. What is buckling? We get a lot of uh, support cases for buckling in the last few months. Uh, it's probably been one of the things that I've handled more than uh, anything else so I thought what a better time to to teach our customers things that um, I've discovered along with some of uh, our customers out there so uh, the buckling solution um, you have your your closed form solution here for Euler buckling and you can see some of the terms here uh, we have our F or our buckling load and we can see some of the dependencies for that load 
Uh, we have our stiffness term here, our modulus. Uh, so that's a material property. And we also have a length. So for a simple beam like this, uh, we can consider this length. Um, as that gets longer and shorter, you can see how that's going to, going to affect the overall buckling load, as well as this end fixity term here. And that's just a value uh, that gets set for uh, the boundary constraints on that uh, beam. So uh, that value can change and that also affects the buckling load. So you could see a few different scenarios. If it's free, free, uh, you allow for some rotation here at both ends. And if it's fixed, fixed, um, you don't have any rotation. So it essentially shortens uh, what that beam would look like. So uh, it has the same effect as decreasing this length term. So uh, just some interesting information about the, the Euler buckling equation. And buckling overall is a kind of an interesting phenomena. Um, one of the things that makes it interesting is that you can have a reduction in your load capacity without actually experiencing any, any mater material yielding or failure. So, you know, you can have that uh, part buckle, uh, you can unload it and then reload it and not have any consequences from a damaged material. Uh, that being said, you can have some material uh, damage in there. So uh, we have a solution for that as well. Two of the common solutions when doing a buckling type of analysis are uh, the most common is linear often referred to eigenvalue based. And this is probably the first step we want to start at. And then we also offer some nonlinear solutions. And we get a lot of customers that want to jump right into the nonlinear. So I, I wanted to take some time and help everyone understand the workflow that we have and maybe um, some tips to help everyone uh, get started and be as efficient as possible. So. How do we analyze buckling? Uh, we're going to go over some of the workflow and then the good and the bad. Uh, some of the, the negative consequences that we have, maybe limitations and results that are available, and then also um, some setup difficulties that might make one analysis a bit more challenging than others. So we want to organize our workflow. Uh, typically, we advise starting with uh, the linear buckling analysis and get your buckling load from that. Uh, it's a very quick solution and use that buckling load um, in a linear static stress analysis. And then we want to start uh, reviewing some of the stresses that are in our model. And I have a simple demonstration of, of that beam we looked at earlier and I'll demonstrate some of that. And then from this linear static stress, we can kind of determine if a nonlinear analysis is, is absolutely required, um, we, we kind of advise doing a nonlinear analysis because it can improve some of the accuracy uh, as far as that buckling load prediction. So um, we'll go through all that with the demonstration later. And so let's get into the linear analysis. Um, when you're doing a linear buckling solution, there's a few things you're going to get out of this. Uh, one of those is this critical buckling value. Uh, you might get a uh, an eigenvalue uh, value, and that number is multiplied times the load that you're applying. So we'll see how that is set up and, and the results there, but uh, that's one of the main uh, pieces of information that you'll get from doing this type of analysis. And next, uh, Probably the, the secondary thing we're, we're going to get in the output is the buckling mode shape. So we're going to see how this part deforms, and then we'll get some additional results from there. You're going to see some stress and some displacement values in there. Um, it's important to realize that those are not a quantitative value. They're relative to each other. So if you're looking and you see that you have a displacement of 34 inches, um, it's important to realize that you know, you, you can't actually use that value. It doesn't really have any quantitative value. So 
um, we're just looking at those values the relative to each other and um, one of the outcomes there is that buckling mode shape so and then lastly when doing a, a linear analysis it's important to realize that these values can be um, traditionally non-conservative so it's going to be an overestimate in in many cases uh, for the demonstration model that we're using today you'll see that um, it's actually um, quite accurate but as your simulations get more complex uh, your models have more and more parts um, you'll see that 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 value can can be overestimated so that's why we would jump into um, the workflow for doing a nonlinear analysis so why do you need to do a static stress analysis this is going to help us determine if there's any material nonlinearities that we're going to have to account for uh, it's a, a pretty simple stress analysis um, not not a whole lot of convergence issues there so um, it's easy to do and it help us, helps us determine where we want to go um, in the future. So this would direct us into this nonlinear area. Um, it can be a bit more challenging. There's, there's some additional things that we have to do when we're trying to do a nonlinear simulation. Uh, nonlinearity is going to account for uh, that geometric nonlinearity and the material nonlinearity as well as give us that post buckling response uh, that's something you're not going to be able to extract from the the linear buckling solution uh, you're going to get that that buckling load and that is where uh, the useful information stops so uh, once we jump into the nonlinear, uh, you can use this to evaluate you know once the uh, structure is buckled now it's going to happen and this can also help us uh, fine-tune our results and get a more accurate buckling response and now we're going to go over some of the good uh, the bad and the ugly of, of setting up these different types of analysis uh, for a linear analysis as we talked about we have linear uh, limited output uh, it's traditionally non-conservative and with all the buckling solutions uh, we have to remember that it's mesh sensitive so you can see here a plot on the right uh, we can see as the element count starts to drop uh, we can see um, an increase in that eigenvalue and if this is being multiplied times our our applied load uh, you can get a quite a different response so uh, it's important to uh, consider your mesh when you're doing this uh, do a few iterations and make sure that um, you're converging on a value and we also want to remember that we're not accounting for any of that nonlinear material behavior and fast and easy solution convergence uh, jumping into nonlinear uh, we are going to consider that nonlinear and geometric uh, material and ge geometric response uh, we're also going to need to consider how we're applying this load. Uh, there can be some convergence difficulties when doing this type of analysis. So that's why we want to start with the nonlinear solution and then work our way up. Uh, you don't want to spend a lot of time um, struggling in, in the nonlinear solution when you could uh, get some points that will uh, in the, from the linear solution that will help you set up this, this analysis here. Again, it's mesh sensitive. Uh, you can get some improved accuracy over those overestimated buckling uh, res buckling load predictions. And then uh, an additional setup for this type of analysis is the need for some imperfections. Some of these imperfections are deformed geometry, so we'll actually want to create some sort of irregularity in the mo in the model and we can modify material properties for one section uh, maybe give it a slightly smaller stiffness value and we're just trying to get some uh, some irregularities in there that's what what all these are trying to do uh, we can modify the mesh uh, this is a uh, probably a bit more challenging especially for uh, like a beam you know you're, you're kind of set with uh, what you're going to have 
uh, shell models, you may be able to manipulate the mesh uh, a little bit more. And one of the easiest ones that I've noticed is doing using a kick load. So we'll apply a small load out of plane and get some very small deformation in the structure. And that's going to give us enough to uh, get that buckling prediction. Otherwise, when you're doing a nonlinear simulation, uh, you can apply a very large load and maybe never see a, a buckling load. Um, the, str the stress will just build up in one particular area, probably where you have a boundary constraint, and the structure will never deform. So, And then lastly, deleting elements. So um, the kick load is the important one to remember here. It's very easy to apply, so that would be my recommended tip. And now we'll jump into a buckling example. So I have, let me open up Inventor. And I have my Autodesk Nastran NCAD environment open here. And I'm going to set my active analysis for this linear buckling solution. I'll walk through a few things here that, that you'll need for your setup. If we go into the edit window here, we can see I've named the linear buckling and we also have our solution types here. Uh, we have linear static, linear buckling, nonlinear static, and nonlinear buckling. Those will be the four primary solution types that we're looking at during this uh, webinar. And I will leave nonlinear transient response for a future webinar. Uh, it's uh, slightly more difficult to set up, and there's some additional information there. Uh, I wanted to uh, leave that for another uh, another webinar in the future. So we have linear buckling selected here. And I want to emphasize to everyone, uh, you can work through the model tree on the left here, uh, but it's quite a bit easier to just follow through the ribbon from left to right uh, going through, um, set your analysis type. Uh, we can actually edit here, uh, same as we have on the right click for the solution type. And then we'll go through, select our material. And I've already defined a material, but um, you can define that here. Some of the material properties, since I have a, a beam here, it's fixed at the bottom. 10 inches long and it has a axial compressive load at the top that's going to drive this buckling load. Uh, for the structural properties, we're going to have 3e to the 7 and then a Poisson's ratio of 0.3 and I'll just cancel out of here since I've already saved my buckling material. We'll jump to the physical button. And this is where you're going to apply your physical properties. So we'll go ahead and select the line element. And then we can def select the material that we define. So I have my, my buckling material defined. And continuing on, we're jumping into constraints. Uh, you select this, it uh, gives you the option of selecting your entities, what kind of boundary constraint you want to apply to that, and then which subcase that that gets set to. Next, this is where you would apply the load. For the linear buckling solution, we only need this compressive load. Once we get into the nonlinear buckling, uh, that's where we'll apply our secondary load or that kick load that I referred to. And we'll do the global mesh uh, for this since we have a beam element that is 10 inches long. I want to break this up into 10 segments. Um, again, you know, this can be mesh sensitive for this particular problem. It's very ideal. Um, the loads are all in plane or um, in the, the length, you know, through the length of the, the beam. So um, if, if we're looking at something that maybe had an, an off-axis load or multiple uh, beam elements, uh, structures that are combined into this, like a radio tower, um, 
then we may want to uh, look at refining this mesh. But for what we're doing here, it's, it gives a very accurate response. And then you could select the update button and it will apply the mesh settings. And then we can run the solution. And I ran this earlier, so I'm hoping that it runs again. And we see here that our NASTRAN solution is completed. Go ahead and select Contour, Deformed, we'll jump to our options. And this is taking a load. Uh, well, that's going. Um, we'll jump, I'll show you a, uh, some information that we get in the output here. We have mode one, uh, eigenvalue of 0.94. So we can see that this 0.94 times the load that we applied over here. Or we can see I have a linear buckling load defined. We can open that up and see that I've applied a compressive load of 2,400 pounds. So uh, that load is being applied in the negative Y direction. That's being applied in both subcases. So we have 0.94 times uh, 2,400 and and that's going to be our buckling load that we have. And I'm still waiting for the options to display. Um, there's not really much to gather from there. Um, the one of the things that we'll be able to see when we would display the uh, deformed structure is we'll see that mode shape. So we'll see that it's fixed down here and it starts to deform out of plane. Uh, we can go ahead and jump to the linear static analysis. We'll set this as active. And so once we have that buckling load, uh, we're going to use that and apply it into our Linux, linear static stress analysis. So this is where we're gonna look at the stress uh, in the structure and what we're looking for uh, to give us a good indication of whether or not we need that um, to do that nonlinear solution is uh, material values. Are we seeing any material yielding? And the one of the ways to do that, um, we'll set this up. I have my linear static load here. And I, I haven't applied the, uh, the actual uh, buckling load from here. I just used the generic load because I knew it was pretty close. Uh, we can go ahead, run this solution, see if we get any errors. Nope, we're good to go. And we'll see if our options window, there we go. Got it to open. And here we can look at our von Mises stress and look at our deformation. And so here we can see we have about 13 KSI. If we were using steel for this, I think steel is around 36 uh, KSI. So we can see we're about one third of that yielding stress for steel. So once we get to around 50% of that yield stress, if we're if we're seeing that in our in our structure somewhere, then we're going to need to account for that material nonlinearity. So that's where um, you see those high stresses. Uh, we're going to want to jump into some sort of nonlinear simulation, and we'll jump to the nonlinear buckling solution. Uh, this is a a feature that NASTRAN NCAD has. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the uh, simulation mechanical. Um, it does not have this option available. So this is uh, pretty cool. And it's basically the same setup. Um, one of the things that you may want to note here is I have different loads selected for, for each type of analysis. And so if I was going to use the same load in all my analyses. If I change it here, 
then it's going to affect my other analyses. So that's why I went ahead and, and rename, uh, recreated a new load for each analysis type and named it accordingly. So I can change this without affecting any of my other simulations. And we'll go ahead and run this. As you can see, um, those linear solutions are very fast. And now that we're doing the nonlinear, um, we have to do some iterations. And it does take a little bit longer. Um, you can see for this, this simple structure, it, it's taking a bit longer. If you were doing a whole a large radio tower or maybe a, a pop can is a, a classic example of, of a buckling type problem. Um, you can see that, that that would add up significantly. So we'll go ahead and plot some of our results. Go into our options. And here we'll, for our contour options, we're going to select displacement and give an actual and hit display. And we can see that we haven't had any buckling in our solution here. So we will cancel this and we'll go into our load. We're going to edit this and let's go ahead and increase this slightly. We'll go 2450. Hit run. Let it run through. We'll look at the deformed shape. And then what we'll do is um, look at some ways to plot uh, the solution so we can kind of get a good indication, you know, graphical indication of when that buckling has actually occurred. So we'll go back to our displacement. And of course, it's not displacing. Um, we can look at So we will have to increase this load slightly more. So Dean, does this analysis type also provide us with a multiplier like the linear buckling analysis does? Correct. And so when you're, there's a little bit of difference between this nonlinear buckling and the, the linear buckling solution. In order to ensure that, that we're getting an accurate solution, when we're looking at this uh, mode one here for this eigenvalue, we want to shoot for a value of 1.0 for the nonlinear buckling solution. Um, if it's, say, 0.84, then uh, the solution isn't really, um, isn't, isn't as valid as, as it would be if it was 1.0. So uh, we can see here that it's uh, 0.84. So I think um, we're getting some display issues here on my machine. Um, as far as the, the buckling response, see here we see we get we get that deformed shape, uh, but we can see we have an eigenvalue of 0.84, so um, that means we're getting point or 84 percent of the load applied is is where this is buckling at. So uh, in order to make sure that we're we're getting an accurate solution, we want to decrease the load that we're applying until we get around 1.0. So um, this is a, a just a demonstration, and again, it's idealized, so um, 
but that's a, a great point, Marwan. And of course, we're getting a smaller value here for the eigenvalue because we have applied a bigger force. We're applying 2700 and not 2400 as we did in the linear. Yeah, definitely. So as you increase that force, this eigenvalue is going to drop naturally. And so we kind of uh, covered all the points with the nonlinear buckling and, you know, the setup, how to manipulate that load. Um, oftentimes you won't know what that buckling load is, so you'll have to do a little, a few iterations in order to hone in on, on what you're doing. And, and so that's why it's good to start with that linear buckling solution, uh, get a pretty good idea of, of what that buckling load is going to be, understand that it's going to be um, most likely an overestimate uh, for this type of scenario where we have, you know, one part, uh, very simple structure. We're going to see that it's very accurate um, as you have, you know, more and more parts, uh, more complicated loading, uh, contact, gaps, uh, things like that. Uh, you'll see a, a variation in your results. So, And then lastly here, the last of the four that we're going to cover today is the nonlinear static solution. And so there's a few things here I want to point out uh, in the setup. Uh, one of those is down here in your subcase control, the nonlinear setup. We'll select edit. And how we apply our load here, uh, by default, this is just 10. And so in order to increase the resolution of the of the results that you're getting. Um, this is going to break up the applied load into 10 even increments. So I like to increase this in order to give us a better um, estimate of our, our buckling load. So we'll go to 40 for this. Um, if you're doing a large structure, you know, you may have to jump this up to 100. Um, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, an iterative process and then one of the other things is outputting the intermediate output so uh, for each one of these increments we want to capture uh, the results there so we're going to turn that to on by default that is off and if you turn it on it, it does uh, increase the overhead and uh, the files that are being stored so that's something to consider as well and so we'll go ahead Select run. And we get this nonlinear status inc uh, graphic right here. Uh, this is going to tell us uh, our increment number that we're going through, the number of iterations. And you'll see something very unique uh, for this nonlinear solution. Uh, when we start to get to uh, where the buckling is occurring, uh, you'll see the iterations jump up. And as I noted earlier, uh, the nonlinear solutions do take longer. So something, something to consider when you're setting up your simulation. And we knew uh, we had a good estimate of what that buckling load was going to be. So when we set up our loads here, uh, that's what we're going to use as a starting point. And it's solved. Let's go ahead and view some of our results. And we'll look at the displacement. And we'll go to the end here. And we're not seeing any out of plane displacements. So what we can do is increase our load slightly. Um, we can also do an XY plot of the displacement 
Um, one way to do that is to right click on XY plot, select new, and we can select our displacement. And what we're going to be looking for here is the um, X displacement. So we can do that, and then we can do a show XY plot. And it looks like. <laughs> Go ahead, Marwan. No, I was going to say sometimes in models like this where it's completely balanced, you, you would need that suck kick load that you were talking about earlier. Oh, definitely. Yep, that's a that's a great point, and I got tripped up on my own on my own uh, setup here. Um, thanks for pointing that out, Marwan. We have uh, sure. just the compressive load applied. So as I mentioned earlier. Um, with this nonlinear solution, you need to apply some sort of either geometric or material uh, deformity in here. So let's go ahead and set that up. We will go up here to our loads and we'll name this kick load. Kicked my butt there for a minute. We'll select this top node and we're going to apply a small force just enough to uh, displace this. And it doesn't have to be very large. Um, one of the things you'll notice if you apply uh, too large of a load, that buckling response um, will be harder to identify. Um, the transition from this compressive stiffness to the bending stiffness won't be as clear. So um, it's good to apply a smaller load possible. So we'll do force in the x direction of one pound. And you just want to throw it off balance so you induce that buckling. Otherwise, you'll, as you increase the load without that side load, you'll just keep getting more and more compressed and you will not see the buckling phenomenon. And I would say I can't believe I did that, but anyone who knows me will easily believe that I did that. So we'll let this run through. And we can already see um, that there's some out-of-plane displacement occurring here. And once we do a plot, we'll be able to get a better indication of what's going on with that response. And we're getting close here, or increment 34. And so now here we're seeing this iteration start to jump up. And so that's where we're seeing some nonlinear response. All right, we're completed. Let's go ahead and view some of our results. And so now looking at this, we can see that uh, we've displaced it. So let's go ahead. I'm not sure what's going on here with my display, but I'll go ahead and jump into the XY plot like we were attempting to do before. Now that we have this kick load applied, we can do a displacement in the X direction. And inventor is thinking as it's reading the information, preparing the plot. 
and we have a value of zero. Select the actual node that you want to plot for. Oh, good point. Yeah, I was plotting node one, so that's where it's fixed. So, of course, yeah. we won't see any information there. All right, great. So here we can see that uh, the total displacement in the x direction, because we applied such a small force, uh, we're not seeing any any overall effect compared to the actual um, buckling displacement. So uh, that's that's a really good thing to consider if we were to apply, say, a hundred pound force or a thousand, um, you would actually see a, a significant amount of displacement here. And as we get to where we're starting to see this buckling load, uh, it would be harder to interpret this graph. Um, this curve would be much more gradual, and it would, it would be harder to select, you know, when is this buckling actually occurring? So here we can see that between 0.875 and 0.92, uh, we're, we're starting to see that, that buckling. And so if we calculate that, we'll just do, we'll use 0.875, close this. And we'll pull up the, the compressive load that we're applying, 2,400 pounds. Use my handy dandy calculator. And we see 2,100 pounds. And going back to our PowerPoint presentation, Uh, we can see that the theoretical calculation for this uh, is 2,270 pounds. And these are some other Autodesk softwares that we have, uh, Simulation Mechanical, um, Helios Composite, and then we have uh, Nastran Nonlinear Static. Uh, this is an, another solution. Um, as I was playing with the loads, I was able to get approximately 2,250 pounds for a predicted load. Um, you, know, you could obviously uh, keep working at it until you know you, you feel more confident in that result. Um, but this was just a kind of a validation I was using. Um, one of the, the best ways of confirming one piece of software works is to confirm it against uh, other pieces of software that are available. So uh, it was good to see that the Nastran solution um, for linear, uh, nonlinear are are all in the same ballpark, especially of that that theoretical value that we're trying to achieve. And so, I hope uh, in this presentation, I uh, kind of took some of the mystery away from doing a buckling analysis. Uh, covered the workflow. Uh, start with that linear or eigenvalue-based buckling. Uh, get those values, and then use those values in a static stress analysis to indicate where you need to proceed from there. Uh, from there, you can do the nonlinear buckling solution, and then you can also do the nonlinear static solution and get some of that post-buckling response. If that's something that you're interested in, uh, sometimes customers are, so there will definitely be a need for doing a nonlinear solution. So uh, if this post-buckling response is what you're looking for, then nonlinear is for you. So uh, Nastran NCAT offers solutions for, our, for all of these. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation today. And does anybody have any questions? Uh, feel free to post those in the questions window. Marwan, did you have anything? No, I'm looking at the questions panel and I don't see um, any questions posted up there. Um, so if anyone has a question, please feel free to type your question in and we'll be happy to answer it. Um, just some closing remarks. Um, first of all, that was a very nice model you got there, um, demonstration. Uh, of course, in something like that, you, wanna, you don't want to have a big complicated model, then uh, you won't see the cause and effect very clearly. Um, 
uh, last points there, you know, if you want to do nonlinear sometimes, what, what happens is if you have a more complicated structure, which you typically do than just a bar like that, um, maybe one member of the structure will buckle, but then the others will pick up. Um, then you'd want to see how that happens, and you would want to do a nonlinear um, analysis. Otherwise, uh, a linear buckling will, you know, tell you how how much that value is to buckle, but doesn't show you really what happens when it buckles. Um, you know, which you, know, you could say, okay, it, it might buckle because the weakest member buckles, but then the rest of the structure will pick up and prevent this structure from failing. Um, yeah, that's a great point. And one method that a lot of customers use for doing a buckling analysis is they'll do a combination of linear analyses, nonlinear analyses, and then experimentation. And from that information, uh, they'll be able to look at that linear response and then apply some sort of safety factor uh, so they can go through multiple iterations. Um, getting that linear solution and then applying that safety factor and feeling pretty confident in the results. So uh, that's that's a quick tip for uh, saving some time if you have a, a really large structure and it just isn't feasible to to run a huge analysis with uh, every iteration of your design. And that's a very good point, Dean. And another point is, you know, sometimes you, you, your buckling multiplier might be two or three, which means whatever applied load you have, you know, you're going to need two or three times that load to buckle the structure. But you always want to do a stress analysis, be that a linear stress or a nonlinear stress, just to make sure that your stress level is, you're okay with the stress level. So, all right, it doesn't buckle, but am I okay with the stresses? So you always want to do that. So it's not just one analysis type, it's, it's, uh, suite of analysis that you want to do to, to, to get all the angles covered, basically. I don't see any questions coming in here, Dean. Um, so Sounds good to me. I think uh, we'll, we'll give some people some time back. A uh, few minutes left until the top of the hour. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. And there is a link down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you'll be able to download uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation as well as some of the files that I used. So you can run through those, uh, play with the settings, um, discover some of the same things that I discovered during the webinar. Um, forget to put that kick load in there and, and see how you don't get any buckling response. So uh, those files will be inside that autodesk.box.com slash Nastran NCAD IQ. So be sure to check that out. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. We'll see you next time.